Good afternoon, everyone. We are just a few minutes away from starting our virtual event at the heart of the matter here with the Colorado Health Foundation. And uh, we're gonna give folks a few minutes to continue logging in and to get settled. Um, but for those of you who are joining us, and I see that number ticking up very quickly, um, welcome. Um, and while we're waiting, uh, I just want to share one quick housekeeping note about language interpretation. Um, we are offering a simultaneous interpretation in Spanish for this event and ask that um, everyone just take a moment to select the language that you prefer to engage in today. So you should see an interpretation feature near the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, if you click on that, you can select either English or Spanish. And if you choose not to select anything, you'll simply hear things in the language that's being used by the speaker. And so I'll give a couple other reminders about that just as folks continue to join us. And we always like to open up these discussions with an engagement exercise that gets folks settled and hearing from one another. Um, so on that note, we're just inviting everyone to share with us a word or two about how you're doing and feeling today. Um, and we ask that you share your words using the chat function. So, to do that, um, go ahead and open your chat window, uh, which can be done by selecting from the menu near the bottom of your Zoom screen. And just be sure that when you're sending a chat that you're selecting the option for all panelists and attendees at the bottom of the chat screen. There's a couple different um, options for you to select from. If you don't choose all panelists and attendees, your chat won't be visible to everyone. So um, again, if you've just joined us, welcome to the at the heart of the matter. Um, we're giving all of our attendees just a bit more time to get logged in and settled before we start. And uh, we've asked our attendees who've joined us to just share a couple of words about how you're feeling today, how you're entering the space for this conversation. And I see folks are starting to pop in, pop in all of your, your notes there. Um, and thank you for that. Um, this is just such a great way to start a conversation like we're going to have today where we're hearing from you and about your communities. And um, again, if you've just logged in, go ahead and chat us a couple words about how you're faring and feeling today. And um, just a technical note, uh, when you're using the chat throughout the entirety of our event today, make sure that you are actually selecting the option for all panelists and attendees at the bottom of the chat screen. That'll ensure that your chat isn't invisible to everyone. Great, and keep those coming, keep them coming. Um, we do still have folks uh, joining us, but I'm cognizant of time and I wanna go ahead and share some, uh, again, important information on accessibility related to today's event. Um, so we do have closed captioning enabled today. And if you'd like to access that feature, please click um, the up arrow near the closed captioning icon in the Zoom toolbar and then select show subtitles and that'll ensure the closed captioning feature is working for you. And again, we are um, offering simultaneous interpretation in Spanish for this event and ask that everyone take a moment to select the language that you prefer to engage in today. You should see an inter interpretation feature near the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you click on that, you can select either English or Spanish. And if you choose not to select anything, you'll just simply hear things in the language that's being used by the speaker. I'd also like to introduce Indira Guzman from Community Language Cooperative, who is gonna explain in detail the interpretation features in Zoom that she and her colleague Lynette will manage for the event today. Um, and just such a big thank you, Indira, to you and your team always. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Taryn. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Indira Guzman and I am here with the Community Language Co-op and the organizers of this event have made a commitment to language justice. What that means is that we want everyone to engage and participate in the language of their heart or in the language that they feel most comfortable in. So for this, we're going to use simultaneous interpretation. At the bottom of the screen, you should see an icon that says interpretation. Make sure you click on that and select the language that you prefer to listen and engage in. Um, we will be interpreting into Spanish and English. Um, so make sure that you select the language if you're not fully bilingual. Uh, I will repeat this now in Spanish and then we'll do a quick sound check just to make sure that everyone can hear. Uh, 
Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Indira Guzmán y estoy aquí con la Community Language Co-op. En este día, los organizadores de este evento han hecho un compromiso a la justicia del lenguaje. Lo que significa esto es que queremos que todos participen en el idioma de su corazón o en el idioma en el que se sientan más cómodos. Para esto vamos a usar la interpretación simultánea. Entonces, en la parte posterior de su pantalla van a ver un icono que dice interpretación. Pueden seleccionar el idioma en el que prefieren escuchar. Si usted trae su celular o si tiene su tablet, puede ir a la opción de más o los tres puntitos y ahí encontrará los ajustes de interpretación. Si tiene alguna duda o una pregunta, por favor, mándenos un chat. Vamos a hacer un chequeo. Este, si todos pueden escuchar en inglés este, o, o en español, este, asegúrense de avisarnos si no se escucha. Muchas gracias. And I think interpretation is on, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Taryn. Thank you, Indira. And uh, welcome again, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's event. Um, you may have noticed a very active chat stream already because we did ask all of our attendees to go ahead and just share with us a couple words about how you're feeling today. So keep those coming. And a reminder that if you want to use the chat function throughout the event today to share questions or comments, um, to just make sure that you're selecting the option for all panelists and attendees in the chat window. Um, otherwise, your chat may not be visible to everyone. And uh, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Taryn Ford. I'm the Senior Director of Communications and Influence here at the Colorado Health Foundation. And I um, just have a, a few additional opening and housekeeping remarks, and then we'll go ahead and get started with today's panels. So uh, for those of you who don't know us or are a little less familiar with us at the Colorado Health Foundation, our mission is focused squarely on working to bring health and reach for all Coloradans. And we do that work in a variety of ways, uh, predominantly by engaging closely with communities across Colorado through investing in grant making, through our public policy and advocacy work, by striving to learn more about how Coloradans feel and think about health. And finally, we also do our work through moments like this one today, where we're gathering together to discuss and explore, explore complex matters related to inequity and racial injustice. And I'm really excited to introduce our final 2020 virtual event in the At the Heart of the Matter series, which of course features our president and CEO of the foundation, Karen McNeil Miller, who's been hosting these regular conversations with local leaders since the pandemic started. And we've designed each conversation as a way to talk directly with Coloradans, to help hear about how your lives and communities are being affected and to allow us to explore and consider what it'll take to create a new and more equitable normal as we all work toward the future. So today's conversation at the heart of the matter, your turn at the mic. Uh, Karen is joined by a really dynamic group of people from across the state who volunteered to join this discussion about how race and health are intersecting in your communities and your work. And we tried our best to structure this as a traditional town hall type of discussion and we divided our volunteers up into two panels, um, both of which I think you'll really enjoy. So just a couple final housekeeping items, uh, a recording of this conversation and a short evaluation survey will be sent to you tomorrow. Um, we will also make a recording of today's event accessible on our website at coloradohealth.org. Um, we do really value your, your thoughts and feedback, so please make sure with, to share those with us in the survey. And we do have uh, quite a few folks who've joined us today. So we've muted audio to minimize background noise. And uh, rather than host a specific Q&A period, we're just encouraging those questions and comments throughout the event. So again, go ahead and type those into the chat box and we'll do our best to answer them. And uh, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, go ahead and put those into the chat box as well and we'll do our best to help you out. And again, just um, a final note to make sure that you're selecting panelists and attendees um, in the chat window drop down to ensure that everyone can see your remarks. And now it is my pleasure to introduce an incredibly compelling and emotional kickoff video titled, We Have to Decide with words produced and performed by a much missed friend of ours here at the foundation and really friend to the world. Uh, Johnny Five of Denver-based hip-hop band The Flowbots with video production by Patrick Chacha. I hope all of you enjoyed today's conversation. We have to decide what we want to see, 
which desires we want to affirm as we, we have to consider who we want to be, what defines and guides us as we call our country free. We have to decide, hay que decidir que intenciones queremos in this Nike Pepsi beer commercial fantasy we see on television. Let's be clear, there's a war on for our minds. And one weapon is fear, una guerra de las mentes, nos atacan con temor y con tantas fantasías, and at our country's borderlines, we implement decisions based on who we think we are. En las fronteras vemos quienes somos. Si vamos a gritar a los que quieren trabajar por muchas horas y cuidar a sus niños y familia, that's horribly bizarre. If we yell at those who want to raise a family and work hard, then what are the alternatives? Hay que considerar las alternativas. Would we prefer people's children starve? Preferimos que no coman? Hay que orientarnos en el mundo que queremos construir en el futuro. Which values do we value? And how can we secure those? Cuando los valores más básicos de la vida conflictuan con las leyes y con la política, entonces la pregunta, the question here remains, ¿cuál tiene que cambiar and which one has to change? We have to decide what we want to see, which desires we want to affirm as we. We have to consider who we want to be, what defines and guides us as we call our country free. Hay que decidir qué queremos ver, qué valores hay que defender y crecer, ¿me entienden? Aunque sea documentado si se puede, undocumented dreams must be made possible today. Y para los que pidan por justicia, ashe. And for all those who plead for justice, love will find a way. Y para los con miedo del cambio, yo sé. I know that change can make us all afraid, but when you see the truth about the history of this water, air, and land, el agua y el aire y la tierra where we stand, comprendes que no somos separados. We are one human family, tree con raíces sagrados. A tree can be a weapon or a wall, a shelter or a source of sustenance. A family can wound you in a dozen different tongues, but no matter where you're from, you're here now. And when the world's turned upside down, the soil's fertile ground. Entonces hoy que planteamos, que sembramos en el campo, que vamos a crecer. How can we grow together? Ambos manos sostiene poder. The power you hold and we hold. The people, el pueblo unido. Good afternoon, friends, and good morning. I noticed uh, someone said they were joining us from Southern California. So good morning to you, and we will all try not to be too nerve, too uh, jealous that you are in Southern California. Welcome, um, as Karen said, to our last at the heart of the matter for 2020. It's hard for me to believe, at least, that it's December of 2020, but yet it is. And if for many of us, uh, well, for all of us, we've certainly been affected by COVID since late February, early March. For us, we have been working virtually since March 11th. I never thought it would have lasted this long and likely will continue till at least March 11th of next year. So this is an exciting time to have a conversation. I think that video summed up a lot of what I saw in your comments about how are you feeling today? Challenged, excited, tense, um, grateful, questioning, wondering, resilient, struggling. So th this is the perfect time for us to, to, end this, to end this conversation or actually to end the conversation for this year. You know, we started in August with the conversation around the intersection of uh, race and health. Then we talked to fierce women of social change. Then we talked to some young folks who we called the next generation of good troublemakers. And if you did not uh, see that, uh, that session, it is certainly worth your time. These, there were some incredible young voices that would make us all proud and hopeful. And then in November, we talked to some uh, folks working on the front line. And what has centered all of these conversations has been our focus on equity and particularly racial equity or inequity, racial injustice and uh, anti-racism. And so we're gonna finish that conversation this, this uh, time with you. 
there were so many of you that volunteered to be panelists and we couldn't could, certainly couldn't take them all but we put together just two wonderful panels i believe of uh, men and women across the age spectrum ethnicity geography uh, nonprofit for-profit life experience uh, to to engage us in this conversation and and really we want to have a conversation so I'm going to ask the first panelists to go ahead and uh, turn on their videos and I'll introduce you. Waiting for a few more, waiting for Delia. There you go. And Christina, we got Christina, Eric, Annie. Um, mine was turned off by the host, the video. I can't turn it on. Oh, all right. So Annie, we'll get you back. <laughs> there you go. All right. So let me introduce you to folks. So when I introduce you, just raise your hands. So we've got Delia Armstrong Busby from Adventures and Learning K-12 Inc. Thank you, Delia. Christina Bejarano from Colorado Association for School-Based Healthcare. Eric Hicks from Metro Caring. Annie Livingston Garrett from NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness in the High Country. Uh, Stephanie Wasserman, hi Stephanie, who's with Immunize Colorado. Deborah Wilcox, who's from Confluency Consultants and Associates, and Salvador Hernandez, who's from the Familia Vota. Welcome, all of you, and thank you for joining us on this conversation. I noticed you all had, I noticed some of the words that you used. Annie, the word you put in the chat box for how you're feeling was tense. Tell us about that for a minute. I've never done this before. <laughs> and so, um, afraid my technology might go kaput and uh, I've just never done it before. Well, so. welcome. You're amongst friends. <laughs> we're going to have a wonderful conversation. We've never done one like, like this before, so we're all in the same boat for this one. So <laughs> just relax. All right. So we're going to talk about how um, racial inequity is present in the work that you all do or how you are addressing it. And then we'll kind of wrap up with how, what advice you would give the foundation as we work to also deepen our work in equity to focus on Colorado's of color. So let me, I'm gonna put kind of a broad question out there and just ask you to respond. So what are the ways you see racial inequity um, in your work and how are you addressing it? Yeah, you're the one that's off mic first. I'm going to let you start. Oh, boy. Uh, personally, I have been at the forefront of uh, legal actions uh, within the, the realm of education and within the realm of health. Uh, at Adventures in Learning, we work with families that are struggling and students that are struggling. But on a personal level, I have served on the Board of Depression Bipolar and look at the absence of people of color being involved in organizations like that. So I have a long history in many fronts in uh, racial issues and organizations that deal with them. I'm currently the chair of the Colorado Springs Human Relations Commission. And so we get complaints about the racial stuff and we try to find ways of dealing with it through structures set up by the city of Colorado Springs. And give some examples of what you hear about the inequities, uh, particularly in the K-12 systems that you work in so deeply. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm focused on right now with several other people, some of whom are, are out of state, is the fact that in the state of Colorado, when you get into the area of the over-disciplining of children of color, there is no accountability on the side of the school district for the fact that these children are usually failing also. 
And what we're trying to do working with some of the legislators is to have the uh, law change so that over disciplining is more clearly linked to failure because districts are accountable in their accreditation for student achievement and an overly disciplined child is not an achieving child. So we're trying to adjust that. Oh, that's, that's uh, you know, I've never heard it phrased that way, although it's absolutely um, intuitive that that, was, that that would follow, but I've never actually heard anyone uh, targeted that specifically. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Now, Annie, um, Delia mentioned mental health, particularly, at the, I think she was talking about the African-American community, but tell us how you're seeing inequity show up in, in the mental health arena that you focus on. Well, I'm with NAMI, which is a large grassroots-based organization, uh, probably the largest grassroots advocacy group in the country for mental health. Um, and I was just thinking as Delia was talking, because it's been very different in different states, and I moved here from Tennessee. And in Tennessee, what, one of the things we did was work with our Black churches, because our experience was that people went to the preacher first. And what's turned out from that is lots of folks have, have now counselors at, the, uh, at churches, which is great. Um, here, I live in Leadville, which is a small rural mountain town, and we're more brown than anything else. And what I've noticed here is there aren't, I don't know that there's a single Spanish speaking therapist, but I'll have to find out for sure at our mental health center. Um, and we don't have a Spanish speaking facilitator for any of our groups. I don't know if we could somehow through Zoom and you all may know, I'm, I'm a technology dinosaur, I'm old. So, um, but I don't know if there's a way to translate in other ways, and there may be. But if you can't talk to someone who speaks your language, it seems to me it's going to be awfully hard to get well or get into recovery. And I remember a friend of mine who was Hispanic, and her family made her go to the priest for an exorcism because they thought it was something, the devil or something else she was hallucinating and stuff. She stayed with NAMI and she's, she's doing great today and her family's learned about it, but you have cultural things that happen and, uh, you know, uh, we have to learn to work with each other and yo hablo espanol muy poquito and, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. So language justice, you see language justice as an issue in the mental health arena in Europe. Yes, and, and I see in my community, um, housing is mainly in our trailer parks and, um, you know, it's uh, we have one, um, grocery store, one small mercado, which is nice, um, but not a lot of choices for people oh, and you. not a lot of insurance yeah. either. Well, thank you. Deborah. Feel like you wanted to get in. Yes, um, first of all, and this is just a real joy to be in a conversation. I don't think there's anything better than a good conversation. And I have been uh, participating in all of the heart of, of matters. So I was really uh, excited about being a part of the panel today. Um, the scope of my, I'm new to Colorado relatively, relatively now. I've been out here three years uh, teaching at Metro in integrative healthcare. Uh, the scope of my practice is organizational development, health and wellness coaching but I am, I'm also a clinician. And since the pandemic, pandemic, I have been involved in providing a leadership along with colleagues around the country in um, forums to really get in touch with how to stay well, how to stay connected 
um, you know, during the pandemic. So we've had uh, forums called What the People Say, which Gullah Geechee kind of culture. Some of my colleagues down in Savannah, Georgia, and, uh, and around in Ohio. Uh, also very active in the Association for Black Psychologists. And we are doing what you call the emotional emancipation circles, uh, which is just for African, Black and African American people to work on holistic health and wellness. Uh, also involved in a mental health recovery peer centered uh, initiative called Wellness Resilience Story Circles. And uh, we are working with an exciting group called Poetry for Personal Power, who has been working building a wonderful peer community. And we've also have Eaton Community Centers. Uh, community is also joined with uh, uh, the Wellness Resilience Story Circle. So we have an ongoing building of peer support. So I wanna certainly put a, uh, a, a shout out for peer support is the way to support sustained mental health recovery and wellness, but it also builds community around cultural differences. And it also allows people to learn who we are around our differences and support each other in our holistic health and well being. So, um, with that said, um, I have been working in psychiatric rehabilitation for the past 10 years as a practitioner and researcher and also providing multicultural competency, um, professional development within community-based organizations and mental health agencies. So I'll kind of stop there, Karen. Uh, that's a little bit about my practice and uh, what I value. So um, Deborah, as, as Annie was talking about some of the cultural differences, what are some of those cultural stigmas that you see uh, that are barriers to people acknowledging mental health issues or seeking help? You know, one of the things that's exciting about the um, mental health recovery movement is that um, people who have suffered with severe and persistent mental illness and substance abuse challenges, you know, for long periods of time through life uh, journey, you know, the movement has been a social justice movement that says nothing about us without us. And uh, one of the biggest barriers is that we don't know each other, whether we have a mental health diagnosis or not. You know, we as a, as, you know, people who live in the United States, we just don't know each other. And we don't understand who we are as cultural beings and how those differences play out in our interpersonal relationships. So that's the work that has to be done and is being done. So I think, Karen, that's one of the biggest barriers. That's why this conversations like this is so important that we can just show up and be our authentic selves. And as leaders in this world, open a space for these kinds of conversations mm -hmm. to take place. Thank you. And, I, and if you'll check the chat, some, someone just uh, commented that said that put your comments point out something important that they learned from the work of Paul Farmer when they were in Haiti the, about the intersections of culture, community, and public health. Abs absolutely. And that to know that uh, culture shapes worldview that we don't look at the world the same way. You know, there are relational cultures, you know, Hispanic and African-American and Asian cultures are very group and relational people, you know, and Europeans and white folks are pretty individualistic, you know, and it's not a judgment. It's about, we look at the world differently and we got some learning and unlearning to do so that we can individually become uh, well, as well as build well communities. Sustain well communities. Thank you. And in, so well community certainly is there well communities from the from the mental health standpoint and also well communities from the physical standpoint. So Stephanie, in her work around immunization, you you got nothing to cut you got nothing to do coming up in the next few months, I know. So <laughs> you know you can yeah. just take it easy for the first seven months of 2021. But not just with the, you know, I know you're concerned very much with the equitable distribution of the COVID vaccine, but also the equitable distribution of vaccines uh, in general. So I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the inequities that you are dealing with every day and trying to, to mitigate. Yes, thank you so much. And I love uh, what uh, Ms. Wilcox mentioned about peer support and just getting to know each other. That's such a critical message during this time when our, our differences are just being exploited, to tell you the truth. Um, 
Yeah, so we, um, we are feeling such a sense of urgency around so many of these issues. Um, one is on the one end of the spectrum is just uh, new data coming from the CDC about how um, uh, Medicaid eligible children are not getting their routine immunizations. So newest data says that 1.2 million doses of vaccine um, have not been ordered by states for vulnerable children, Medicaid eligible children compared to last year. So that means children are more at risk for the diseases that we do have tools for, vaccines such as measles, polio, um, whooping cough, and those, those diseases for some children can be relatively mild, including polio, but we don't have the science to know which kids are going to be felled by these diseases versus those that can recover. So it's so critical that we get our children, all children, uh, routine immunizations. And then what we're also dealing with is um, if anyone chose to have a veil over their eyes around health uh, equity issues prior to 2020, that veil had to have been lifted because it's with a horrifying view that we're seeing how COVID has disproportionately affected communities of color with five times, up to five times more people uh, of color getting uh, COVID, uh, going to the hospital and dying from COVID. So with a vaccine right around the corner, hopefully we are urgently working on making sure that not just the vaccine is equitably disseminated, but that we uh, are, we, 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 we regain trust in communities that have such uh, mistrust of the medical establishment so that they will accept a vaccine. And with that, we've launched the Colorado Vaccine Equity Task Force. And uh, Christina, uh, uh, coincidentally, Beharano, who's on this panel today, is on that task force to really um, bring together stakeholders from diverse uh, organizations and perspectives to help rebuild that trust in our community around the importance and safety of both routine vaccines and hopefully this coming vaccine and establishing those peer networks and those trusted sources of information in faith-based organizations and schools in healthcare settings with elected officials. And we have so much work to do, but we're so grateful that Colorado does have such a passionate voices around these issues. And we're really um, hoping that it's, it's not just the vaccine that will end this pandemic, but it's vaccination. So we have to get vaccines in arms and really address these horrible um, ongoing disparities that we're seeing with COVID. So Stephanie, in case we've got folks on, that joined the call who don't understand uh, why some ethnic minorities have a distrust of vaccination or the medical system. Give, give them the, the 101. Yeah, I mean, this really gets at the root of everything we're talking about in healthcare is that there have been just historical um, structural issues in our healthcare system that have disproportionately impacted everything from uh, access, uh, cultural barriers, um, experimentation on people, uh, informed consent. Uh, and it, it unfortunately is currently still occurring and um, it occurs uh, you know, under a veil of secrecy and then it gets exposed and we raise up our arms in horror, uh, you know, going back to Tuskegee. But you know, even in the 1990s, there were missteps that the CDC did with an experimental vaccine that you know, we're just learning about now. So it's something that we need to, to be incredibly aware and educated about and be honest that there were these horrible miscarriages mis, uh, of, of uh, historical injustice that was done to communities of color. And we just need to be honest and open about sharing that information, about acknowledging it and saying, you know, we, we need to do things entirely different moving forward. Thank you, Stephanie. Eric, I've been watching you. You've been nodding vigorously 
during everybody else's comments. So your turn. No, I'm thank you, Karen. And I'm I'm so glad that Stephanie Stephanie mentioned what it previously what has previously taken place in this country, um, just in the matter, matters of race in our in our BIPOC community and people of color. I think for the the aspect of the disparity that already existed prior to COVID and how COVID and how COVID created an, uh, an even larger gap is extremely important, not only from a nutrition, uh, nutrition standpoint, but also from an economic standpoint. Um, people of color were already um, the lowest wage earners. They already had less access to healthy food. And with, with uh, the guidelines that have been set nationally and within the state, although they are for our safety, they, they, they provide such a, a larger disparity. Um, at Metro Caring and, and food, food pantries and markets and banks throughout the state and throughout the country, there have been opportunities for individuals to go in and, and have an equitable experience in shopping for their food um, if they don't have the means to walk into a grocery store and purchase it. I think that for, for us in having to move to a drive-through model and, and pass out food where that equitable experience is taken away, too, too often the, the people who are poor in this country, um, the first thing that's stripped away outside of the funds that they have is, is, is the power of choice. And for us, I think um, what we've seen from that perspective, as well as from a nutritional perspective, that um, you know we've had where African-Americans are around 75% more likely to contract diabetes and us having to engage with those individuals virtually that is, if they have the correct equipment, the Wi-Fi, um, these these disparities are not only are not only existed prior, but they're growing and they continue to grow. So, how do we as a community connect and involve the community in connecting and making sure that that, that it doesn't continue to grow into? Thank you, Eric. Do you Eric? Do you see? Um, any end in sight for the need for for food? Hope so, Karen. <laughs> um, but honestly, um, I th there will be no end in sight in, until we start addressing uh, addressing systems, um, the, the food system, systemic inequalities through throughout this country have always privileged the the haves and and the have nots have been left for scraps. And too often, I have not um, often look like me. Thank you. I just this weekend was reading. Somebody posted something on Facebook that talked about an example that was given a hundred years ago about the difference between the the poor and the and the more well off, and it was like a a, a worker needs boots to work, but they can't afford the fifty dollar boots that would last them ten years, so they can only afford the fifteen dollar boots that last them a year. So over the course of ten years, they paid more for boots because they have to pay $15 a year. So it actually costs more for um, families living on low income over the long, over long haul. Salvador, let's get you in this conversation. Talk, tell us a little bit about what you're doing and how you're, how you're dealing with these inequities. Yeah, um, yeah thanks, Karen. Um, and just, just before I dive into that, I completely agree, you know, uh, particularly what Eric had, you know, mentioned about, you know, the changing the systems, uh, you know, that affect, you know, health equity or health justice. But within the Latino community, we believe, you know, that is, is also a, a matter of, you know, like economic justice and, and you know, and immigrant justice for that matter. Uh, my work is to work directly with, you know, the Latino community uh, in terms of like civic engagement, our mission is to build that political power so that we have the voice to be able to change those types of systems that, you know, that are, you know, uh, affecting our community and the Latino and immigrant community in particular. But, you know, we, we believe that, you know, the, the first step uh, to have that conversation is to, to, to educate the community uh, in terms of what it takes to, to make a difference. Uh, for us, you know, we believe it is stars way at the bottom with, you know, uh, uh, voting rights, when, you know, when people go out to vote, uh, when we elect people that look like us, when we have 
our community be uh, taking an active role in the conversations, whether it is for, you know, health uh, equity or immigration uh, justice. Uh, you know, like we believe that us, you know, the, the, the people who are affected the most should be the ones who are, you know, leading the conversation. And um, somebody else mentioned, I don't know who it was, but it was, uh, you know, like nothing with, you know, nothing about us without us. Like we, we believe we believe in that model uh, strongly. Um, so at Mi Familia Vota, like we have, you know, dedicated, you know, the past 10 years to building political power uh, within the Latino community. And this, you know, has been a movement led by people of color, immigrants. Um, I am, you know, myself an immigrant. I, you know, have, you know, came to this country when I was 15 years old. I was undocumented for the first seven years that I was here in this country until I was able to, you know, to to adjust my status through through DACA. Um, so I know like firsthand what it is, you know, to be first undocumented in this country. And, you know, but second, like, you know, not have access to, you know, such basic things like, you know, um, health insurance, you know, let alone not being able to afford health insurance. I didn't have access to it. So even if I had the means, I couldn't access, uh, you know, any type of health insurance or health services for that matter. Um, and we, you know, we have seen, you know, the disparities that, you know, uh, that Latino communities, but particularly the undocumented community have to go through. Um, when it comes to health equity. So uh, at Mi Familia Vota, it's, it's what we believe in. We believe in uh, making sure that we have a voice at the table, that we participate. Um, and, you know, like we, we have continued, you know, doing the work, you know, of voter registration, of educating people, uh, you know, like on the different issues. So completely agree with what everyone else has said. Salvador, how are you um, working with within community around the fear, particularly for those who are undocumented? I mean, it's, it's always been, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, I think like a, a community-based effort in terms of engaging with the undocumented community. I myself was undocumented for so long, but there is, I feel like the, the greatest barrier to, uh, to the undocumented community, like engaging in the conversations, um, it's just you know that 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 fear of you know uh, deportation or the uncertainty of not knowing what's going to to happen. You know, um, we saw you know this uh, the current uh, you know Trump administration uh, increase the rhetoric against you know undocumented immigrants and you know and, and us being blamed for you know uh, or being demonized for some of the problems that you know uh, perhaps the system hasn't addressed. Uh, because of the way that is set up, but you know, bringing bringing the com the undocumented community out of the shadows into the light, I think, will be like the first step. Like uh, when we're talking about you know health equity and you know racial equity and all of these things that at the heart of the matter, like we believe they are interconnected. Um, and and you know, like we we can talk about you know uh, immigration reform without you know talking about you know uh, you know humanitarian needs at the border. Or things of that sort. So, uh, it's uh, it, it, it's a tough, you know, conversation to have that you know it, we've been having with the com with the community uh, for years and years. But at the end of the day, like we feel that the way to do that is you know through through education, to engaging with the community, um, showing them you know that we do have a voice, making you know the community feel like powerful. Um, that you know, even though that we are undocumented, we have a voice. I tell my story every time I go uh, into schools, Karen. Like when I, um, when I tell students, hey, like I was in your shoes. I was undocumented, you know, when I was in high school, um, and I didn't know like what my future was gonna going to look like. But you know, here I am, like 12 years later, and I'm still, you know, like, um, uh, you know, like fighting for for social and, and economic justice. Um, right. Just, yeah. Thank you, Salvador. Christina, you've been very patient to join the conversation, so come on in. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And, and I agree with, with everyone. I, I am, like Salvador, uh, a few, just a few years older, but I was there too with the same story, right? With my family not being able to communicate, to be able to advocate for, for 
me and, and hoping that we can focus in our communities of color and the incredible um, potential that, that we have and all the work that we're doing for our communities. And we typically serve our communities. We stay in our communities and serve in different ways. We work um, with school-based health centers based in the schools uh, with a strong partnership with schools and, and the families trust us that right now with COVID, we see our communities are being hit hardest because of the historic um, racism that we have experienced. But another thing that we have seen is that with schools being closed and with um, the increased need on mental health services, our communities as communities of colors tend to, like uh, somebody said, uh, I think it was Deborah, we, we're, we live in community and the impact not only in educational achievement and economic achievement and, and health equity is, is big and, we're, and we are going to continue to see it in the next few years. So this is a time where we see the partnerships are more important and, and at least for us, we're trying to see how we are most useful for, not only for the clinics that we serve as an association, but also for the schools uh, where our school partners are overwhelmed. They have said so many times, we, we feel hiled on and, and we need your help, but at the same time, we need to um, have the staff to be able to support what the schools need and the children for all of our communities to continue growing in their economic path, they need, uh, the, the children need to be able to learn and to eat, like Eric said, the, the, the food and nutritional needs of our communities are still there. And, and as organizations, we are working harder than ever to address the needs of, of those communities that are because of the historic nature of the racism, sometimes they're close and we're just having to remind them that we're here to help them. Um, so I, I cannot agree more with everything everybody said, which is we, we really nourish ourselves and communities. Uh, thank you all for all those thoughts. And I'm selfishly gonna ask the question, you know, I'm not naive enough to to believe that philanthropy in general or the Colorado Health Foundation in particular, it can solve racism and oppression, but what's the role you think we could play? What, what could we do as we center uh, racial justice and racial uh, equity in our work? What, what's the role we could play? Deborah, you came on, on mute and then I'll have, Deborah, then Annie. Yes, um, I, you know, I, I made a note to myself that the systemic work that we have to do has to be democratic. And we have to make sure that we flip these centers of dominance. And what I mean by that is these hierarchy structures that are embedded in all of our organizations, whether it be small nonprofits or large organizations. It's so important that we as leaders, thought leaders in this work, create a space for authentic voice, just like we're having today, you know, for choice and voice. So everybody feels heard and really learn what it means to, to um, contribute to a larger uh, complex problem. You know, we have difficult and, pro difficult and complex issues that cannot be solved with one technical answer. But we know that if we build community and have collective voice, we can co-construct the kind of initiatives that will be culturally appropriate for organizational and systemic change. And so I wanna put that out there. We have to unlearn hierarchy. We have to be responsible for our power and our influence and, not, and use it in a way that promotes well-being and not power over relationships. That's what the peer, uh, in mental health, that's what the peer movement has been all about. Is like we need the educated clinicians on tap, but not on top of the voices recipients because today we might be a participant, uh, I mean an expert in a particular issue, tomorrow we're going to be a recipient. of. So we're all in this together. There's no hierarchy in healthcare. 
where it is, it's about community. I guess the other comment I wanna make around that as well is that we really need to understand more about the comorbidity because the research is clear. There's a comorbidity between mental health and chronic disease. So when we open a space for people to work on their wellness, to learn what holistic health and wellness is around you know, working with trauma, working with physical life and nutritional life and spiritual life and emotional life, and setting goals around that and getting peer support, then we'll start to see some reduction in chronic disease, how to engage with providers in a way that's partnership and collaborative. So I'll end my remarks there, but we, I think the, in summary, I wanna say that we have the answers collectively to co-construct appropriate interventions to create holistic health and well-being for individuals, families, and communities. Thank you, Deborah. Annie, did you want to comment on that? It's hard, hard act to follow, Deborah. Uh, one of the things that I have made a commitment to is to learn as much as I can because as part of the so-called, well, I am privileged, uh, but I didn't grow up thinking that. So I'm having to re-educate myself hugely. And one of the things you said on leadership too, I recently applied to be on a board of uh, my public radio station and I wrote at the bottom, but if you can find people of color to serve on this board, I respectfully don't want to be considered. And they did it. They got two more people of color on their board. And I, and that was, you know, I think as white folk, <laughs> we need to think more about putting our leadership back here of what we think was our leadership too, because it wasn't always the best for folks of color, I think, but I mean, we need to take a step back. We need to educate ourselves. I think racism's in our genes. I hate to say that, and I don't mean blue jeans, folks. And we have to start backing up and putting forth new leaders. And I'm so glad you had the young folk on a while back, Karen, because those are our, I'm so happy for that. But anyway, that's kind of my point of view at this point, personally. Christine, I'm let you have last word because we'll need to switch to the next panel. Your, to your question, what can you do? I think you, by leading with, by example, you are opening the, the conversation and being brave and asking what do we need to do? All of us, Annie, have biases. While I might be a person of color, I have my own bias and we all need to increase our awareness. And by you asking us to commit to having goals to address racial inequity with your funding is the way you have the power with us, but also the power with your colleagues in philanthropy, you are showing them the way. And, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I wish, I know we could, we could all go on for another hour or so, but thank you so, so much um, for your time and for your participation going to ask you all to go ahead and go uh, off video as the members of the second panel join us. Hello, hello, hello. All right, I'm, raise your hand as I introduce you. Thank you for, for waiting patiently. And I know you've probably got things you want to respond to from the first from the first group and we're gonna cover all that ground again. So I have um, Maria Gonzalez, who is the Adelante Community Development, uh, Talisa Hawkins from Cherry Creek Mortgage, Martha Prophet from the Colorado Public Health Association, John Reed from the Center for African American Health, Elena Thomas Faulkner from the National Institute for Medical Assistant Advancement and Ross Valdez from Tri-County Health Network. Oh, so thank you all again. Uh, I'm, we're just gonna continue the same conversation and start with, uh, you know, again, how, is, how are racial inequities showing up in your work and, 
and uh, how are you all addressing it? And I'm going to start with Ross. Given that you was Tri-County Health Network, y'all have been busy. I'm just going to say it. Y'all got some hard heads in your, <laughs> in your jurisdiction. So what, what are you all, what, how, is it, how are you all addressing inequities? Right. Um, well, I think that there's probably some commonality between all of us that COVID-19 has definitely elevated a lot of these inequities in ways that we never could have imagined. And so there's a lot of different ways. Uh, so I'll try to keep it concise. Um, a lot has been around uh, language justice and misinformation. And so as you can imagine, um, some of these communications, public health orders uh, specifically, or emergency notifications can relate to uh, people's health, but can also relate to people's um, kind of well-being in the sense that it might affect whether or not, or not they're going to be able to go to work. And one of the obstacles that we ran against was um, that these communications were coming out uh, in a way that was accessible. Um, and that includes not coming out in um, any language other than English. Uh, and so we've kind of worked to tackle that and we can dive into that later if anybody wants to ch chat about that. Uh, and there's also obviously a lot of misinformation, a lot of misinformation about COVID-19, but, but then also a lot of misinformation around um, public benefits. And uh, especially with uh, the immigrant community that we work with, it's misinformation that can impact whether or not somebody decides to help provide uh, uh, support for their family through you know, SNAP uh, or Medicaid. And so it's definitely been a lot of work trying to spread truth, spread facts, uh, and make sure that people are accessing public benefits when they're eligible to access those benefits. Um, outside of that, it's also been a lot of uh, cultural differences that have kind of been highlighted. Uh, one recent example is that, you know, some people are afraid to go to the hospital because they don't know what it's going to cost, as, as we all know, like hospital systems and the costs that you might experience as a patient varies dramatically from the country that you're from and what, how, what the health system looks like there. And so there's been people that have been hesitant to even get the, the, the medical care that they need. Uh, and then finally, one of the uh, other aspects that's changed a lot, and I alluded to that earlier, is uh, just the changes that have happened in immigration law. So if you look at the changes that have happened for people that enjoy uh, temporary protected status, for example, or even just like the back and forth battle between the, the new public charge rule and the old public charge rule. And so trying to keep people informed to make sure that they make decisions that aren't gonna put themselves or their families in a detrimental position. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's been a lot of work from a lot of different aspects, but um, I think we're rolling with the punches. Thank you, Ross. Martha, you, your work is focused on public health, you know, certainly broader than just the three county area that Ross, uh, Ross is in. So what, what's your experience of the state of public health as it, as it relates to work, uh, addressing racial inequity? Hi, Karen. Thank you. So, uh, yes, I'm on the board of the Public Health Association and the Associate Director of Public Policy, which will then be the focus for uh, my comments. So racism in public health um, really is the backbone of two um, public policy campaigns that we're launching at the beginning of 2021. Um, and each one has, I guess, four subcomponents that were actually uh, informed by uh, an off-season um, survey of our, well, more than 600 members. So campaign number one is public health leadership in an era of pandemics. And it just is a recognition that public health policy and economic policy are <clears throat> complementary strategies rather than simply a false choice pitted against one another. And that COVID has exposed, as many have said, the underlying inequities in both health and economic systems. So policy for 2021 requires an evidence-based analysis as well as the unwavering support of public health uh, approaches to problem solving. This means for us an evaluation of everything from the state of the state message, state budgetary policy, and its investment in public health on behalf of Coloradans. Um, you know, we've recently, you know, kind of confirmed that 0.5% of um, uh, the general fund goes to public health. But, you know, the special session has been a placeholder. And I think now the focus is Colorado's fair share of the federal emergency relief uh, resources. I think compounding the problem is, is that the states are in such fiscal distress that they're about to lay off workers who currently need emergency relief funds in their own lives. Uh, we're also paying attention, of course, to CDC funding. 
But above and beyond that, I think like all state legislative and regulatory proposals need to be evaluated on um, their impact on public health. That is things going forward, the rules around testing and tracing and vaccine distribution, the reopening of the economy and reduction of transmission rates. Um, the third part of this uh, campaign is the impact of, of COVID policies on their positive or negative impact on health equity in Colorado. This recognizes that communities of color have already paid a disproportionate price with one and a half to two times the death rate. And, and given the moment that we're in, that number four, the vaccine rollout and distribution requires you know, preferential outreach to communities suffering from health disparities with innovative ways to get vaccine to them quickly and consistently where they have their trusted relationships where they reside. This recognizes, for example, that you know, zip codes predominantly uh, people of color are 67% more likely to have a shortage of primary care practitioners, which is a key component of the infrastructure of vaccine administration. So our second campaign that you could read into our first is racism as a public health crisis. And our approaches are to address structural racism in healthcare, everything from access and delivery, workforce and health disparities, uh, racism in the criminal justice system, and racism in housing. Our focus is to identify no known threats as well as opportunities in these areas uh, in 2021 legislation and regulation, as well as rolling back current threats. Because public health, you know, is so inclusive, we sometimes we lead from the front, but in something as important and profound as this, we hope just to be a party to a broad coalition to hold the public square accountable. And not just to look externally. And as was mentioned, you know, we have internalized our responsibility to become an anti-racist organization by systematically reviewing and revising our own policies in areas such as, you know, human resources, board selection, investment decisions. Above and beyond all of that, we have an RFI out now for consultant services to help us become more sophisticated. These two main campaigns, you know, don't replace our intense interest in subject matter areas in public health. And so our members have selected for 2021 four areas, healthcare access, behavioral health access, food insecurity, and affordable housing. To have a lens of the intersection of race and health in all of our agendas, you know, we hope to objectively measure all of these proposals against their impact on the social determinants of health. And this is an area that we welcome the intel from all of you. Uh, and um, so we have sort of three actions. One is to confirm for 21 a baseline of health inequities and disparities in Colorado, given all the work that you've done so far, that we can bring into our advocacy discussions. Two, to measure each policy proposal against positive or negative impact on health uh, e equity. You know, basically a conceptual bill screen that's akin to financial impact and to look at other national models, uh, which in our case is through our affiliate role within the American Public Health Association and its partners. So in summary, two campaigns driven off the values underlying the intersection of race and health, an internal and external agenda for each, and an interest in participating in a wide tent to bring partners together to leverage our assets of influence. Well, thank you, Martha. It's, it's absolutely, um, I think it's important that public health names racism as a public health issue, hazard, a threat. And uh, my encouragement to you as you widen your tent is certainly include people with live the lived experience as part of your uh, development of your, of, your, uh, of your initiative. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Elena, I don't know much about your organization, the National Institute for Medical Assistance Advancement. Um, Tell us a little, as you talk, what's that, uh, what's that entail and how are you all engaged in the, race, the fight for racial equity? Thank you for that question. Uh, so our organization trains medical assistants to work in primary care settings. Um, and the, the reason I think it's uh, relevant for this conversation is we were really founded by uh, primary care clinics, safety net clinics, uh, working in underserved communities as an effort to both fill a workforce gap, right? They need medical assistants uh, that are well-trained for their setting, but also just as importantly to provide opportunities for education and for entry into a health career in those same communities, knowing that often there may not be an educational opportunity available 
um, or residents of that community haven't um, had the possibilities either economically or through education to be prepared uh, to enter into that career um, in, a, in a, a sort of at the level of a provider level or a pre-med kind of program. Um, and also just uh, economically, often that's out of reach. And so our program is structured as an online program, nonprofit, uh, lower tuition, and um, a, a program that can be done uh, while also maintaining a part-time job or taking care of family responsibilities. So really designed to address some of those barriers um, that, that would keep folks from entering a health career. And uh, really with the stated objective of helping to develop a healthcare workforce that's more reflective of the communities uh, where people uh, live. And we really, we recruit from those very communities with the help of our healthcare partners and other community partners to help uh, make that representation better. Um, and, you know, I think that has been, um, there are some more explicit challenges as we look at an anti-racist agenda that we have really been focusing in on more directly as an organization. So, you know, it, our students, our applicants, when they apply often say, you know, I aspire to become a nurse or I aspire to become a doctor and I wanna start with medical assisting. We think that's great. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we've got that first part down, let's get you started in this career. But I think, you know, if we look more systematically at both healthcare and at education, um, there are barriers to those further steps. So part of our work also has to be, you know, how do we make, build in the um, expectation of those additional steps into the work that we're doing with students and with our healthcare partners? Um, that's one piece. And then the other is really, um, we've been challenging ourselves to determine how we can have more direct conversations about racism um, with our students. And knowing that many of them have had that lived experience, um, but coming in as high school graduates may not have had the opportunity to explore that um, and the impact of that in how they act as a healthcare professional, also in settings where many of the patients um, are, you know, the majority of the patients are persons of color and have an experience that may include uh, the either the history of racism or in their own experience seeking medical care have had uh, instances where they have not been treated the way that they should have. And so our students have one or both of those sort of perspectives um, as they're starting their career in healthcare. And so I would, you know, just to be very um, upfront about the challenge we have right now is to figure out how do we integrate that more explicit conversation um, into our education experience with students um, and how do we prepare our instructors um, to do that as well. Uh, so, you know, I think that's where we see ourselves at that intersection really of three different sectors, healthcare, education, and workforce, um, trying to put in place some things that will uh, open up more opportunity and help to correct um, the, the wrongs that have existed in the past and continue. Thank, thank you, thank you, Elena. I think it's important, yes, that we you bring up the point around you know embedding this into a medical professional training uh, from beginning uh, to end. Thank you, John. What's, what's happening at the Center for African American Health? Uh, well, thank you so much, Karen, and the Colorado Health Foundation team and all the panelists and everyone who's joined. Uh, the question is, what is not happening at the Center for African American Health? Uh, as you probably know, and some of your staff members know, uh, we've been nose to the grindstone and out in the community, making sure that each and every family, each and every client, um, with children uh, get the resources that they need and deserve. And that's included housing uh, resources, rent relief, uh, food, as well as uh, paying bills for those of our community members that have been disproportionately laid off their jobs. Uh, 
You know, I, I want to give kudos to our leadership in Deidre Johnson and our board of directors. I feel we've we've met this pandemic head on with a can do attitude and, and no way will we not churn out every nook and cranny of relief to make sure that our black members of our community get the resources they need. So with that said, we've pivoted uh, virtually, making sure that our community health and wellness navigators have the resource and the training to conduct, to conduct their education programs virtually. Uh, so that doesn't impact knowledge and learning uh, because of the pandemic. And also we've partnered with the city and county of Denver to do COVID-19 testing. Uh, one of the things we're learning is if we offered those services around COVID testing and flu vaccines that our community members are more readily to come to an entity that they trust and know more readily. Um, the, you know, racism and uh, systemic racism is alive and well. And, you know, one of my overarching concerns is, has it become more covert? Um, you know, I applaud uh, some of the foundations uh, for putting more equality and more access into philanthropy, but there still remains, a, you know, a, a broad disproportionate net of inequality in, in that sector of philanthropy where, where some of the resources are not trickling down uh, as readily as we hope they will uh, to the areas in our community that I think need them the most. And then one final thing that we've been, we've been dealing with the perceptions and our leadership has engaged the state uh, on several COVID vaccination panels so that we could better understand uh, the perceptions or the misconceptions uh, and put information and knowledge out there uh, in the community uh, where it's really needed the most uh, before, um, you know, and my suspect is, and I don't wanna be the naysayer is, is is, is that the, the have-nots will not get this vaccine when it's available, and there'll be an even more exacerbated impact on, on those that need it. We, you know, we have, we have organizations from across the state, Larimer County in El Paso, that work with African Americans that are reaching out to us now you know, almost at a, what I would say is an alarming level saying, can you help us construct the programs that you're doing in the Denver area or the metro area so that we could begin to impact positively those, uh, the African-American families and children that live in our communities. And, and a lot of it's disheartening. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm sure it is, John. And I'm really glad to hear that people are reaching out to you and and um, I'm, I'm glad that you all are, have broadened your focus during this time to make sure all the needs are met of community. Uh, Talisa, John mentioned housing. And you're, you know, not the usual suspect on this panel is you're a real soldier. I am a mortgage loan originator. Yes, I am. So tell us in your work, what do you see uh, the effects of uh, racial inequality in the housing and mortgage arena. So I want to, you know, switch gears a little bit because most of us are aware of things like redlining or, you know, unfair lending practices, but I really want to talk about healthcare and where it starts. It really starts before the doctor's office with your access to healthy food or your access to a regular doctor's office, having your own pediatric doctor to see you while you're pregnant and see your children going forward. Um, I'm not from Colorado originally. I grew up mainly in the South. And I can say from my experience in the inner city neighborhoods, there are no doctor's offices. There are no natural food places, places for you to go and get access to healthy and quality food. 
Um, and a lot of the times this drives our lack of understanding or not necessarily seeing it as an urgent reason to go to the doctor or go to regular checkups and things like that. Um, and so it wasn't until I moved here living with my father who you know, was a military vet. And so I got access to government um, access to healthcare that I was able to start going to a doctor's on a regular basis in high school. And I really saw the difference that it made for me and my mental health and just in my personal um, you know, autonomy and how I decide to live my life. And what most people don't understand about this is a lot of the decisions about where the next sprouts will be, where the next doctor's office will be, is determined by the purchasing trends in your neighborhood. How many people are buying homes? Who's buying the homes? And a lot of times in the African-American community, we don't own, we rent. And so because we are all renting and these neighborhoods are pretty much 100% non-owner occupying, they don't look at these areas to put the next sprouts in. They don't look at these areas to put the next doctor's office in. And so you have communities of people who are living in food deserts who also don't have access to stable and quality health care because that those things are in it. I didn't I didn't know that there was private practices because my experience with the hospital with the doctor's office was the hospital, was the ER. The only time we went was if I had to go for shops for school or if somebody broke something or something was really, really wrong and then we went to the emergency room. But having a personal relationship with my primary care provider was not something that any of the kids in my neighborhood were aware of or was even a thing. And so not having, not seeing doctor's offices in a neighborhood, not promoting health in a neighborhood, not seeing for sprouts or whole foods, these natural grocers that are promoting healthy eating or promoting healthy lifestyles, then you see that reflected in the community. Um, the most thing that people are, you know, when people are stressed or anxious, instead of going to the doctor and saying, this is what I'm dealing with, they're going to the liquor store because that's, that's right there. Um, instead of saying, you know, I need to, you know, eat more fiber and I need to figure out a way to, you know, have a more balanced diet. Most of them are just going to McDonald's or Burger King or whatever, because that's what's right there in our community. And so my whole goal in this industry, in the mortgage industry, is to really show people the political and economical power of home ownership and what you can leverage in owning a home. When you purchase a home, that is your buy-in into your community. That is your share into the government. And so now when you have questions about your neighborhood, your schools, your local grocery stores and any new businesses that are being developed in your community, you can go to town hall and have something to stand on because you're a taxpayer. You're actually out here making these decisions. And a lot of times we're down at the school boards complaining. We're upset about the way the school's treating our children. We're upset about the way the police is doing things in our community. And most of the time we don't own anything in these neighborhoods and the school board doesn't work for us. They work for the taxpayer. The police department works for the taxpayer. So uh, a lot of times your landlord is the one making those decisions. And do you really trust your landlord to make decisions about your future and the future of your child? Talika, one of the things you're pointing out is kind of the, one of the basics of the definition of inequity is that you shouldn't be able to predict by race or by zip code, you know, the, 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 the outcomes that, that people would be experiencing. So thank you. Let me go to Maria. Tell us a little bit about your work and how, how the, the racial injustice and how you're approaching it and in in the, how you spend your, your, your committed time. Well, first, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And I am so delighted to hear that I'm not the only one fighting this every single day, every single moment. Uh, your support and, and your understanding about the issue really makes me feel a lot more empowered and to making sure that I'm going in the right direction and I can look at you know, different angles, uh, different perspectives. Um, Adelante Community Development is an organization that started five years ago in Commerce City only to serve economic development uh, disparities, uh, particularly working with undocumented and Spanish speaking uh, Latinos. Um, this is actually the first, I, I was the founder uh, original and this is the first year that I am acting at uh, executive director capacity. And uh, we had so many plans like everybody for 2020. 
And all of a sudden we find ourselves into tackling an issue that we had never faced before uh, with lack of funding, with lack of uh, direction from government entities. And uh, as an organization facing all of these challenges in order for us to have the uh, community that it's mostly in need. Our work started immediately uh, with the Adams County um, Economic Development, Adams County Government and Tri-County Health Department to understand you know, how do we collaborate to bring that message, to bring those voices of the community. Um, and on every day we receive you know, 200, 300 calls, all the Spanish speaking community throughout the metro area talking about basic human needs. Uh, going to get COVID testing, um, medication. Traditionally, our Latino community has been relying on over-the-counter medicine, uh, has been relying on uh, carnicerias, meat markets to get their shots for different things. And so there's a lot of miscommunication, there's a lot of misinformation and not enough awareness in the language of preference, in the um, cultural relevancy that it's needed in order for us to really breach that um, communication and in, involve this Latino community into this decision making. I believe that now we as a community need to leverage uh, the positive thing about COVID is getting us together to identify all these issues and create policies that really incorporate the needs of every single one of our members in our communities and holding um, elected officials, government entities accountable for how they distribute resources along the communities. I understand there's several uh, um, long established Latino um, organizations that have supported the community for many years, but I also doubt some of the services that they have been providing, some of the outreach that they have been doing. And I think it's an opportunity for all of us to really take in consideration who's doing that work who is really getting out there to the community, meeting them where they need to be met, and how do we establish that accountability to those agencies as well? Because as we compete for funding, which we shouldn't be competing for funding, we should be working in alliance to make sure that the message is clear, the community needs us, and it is time for us to fundamentally make these changes that will create an impact for generations. I hear a call from a mother that her, her husband passed away with COVID. She is laid off from work. She is undocumented. She has three kids. They live in a mobile home park. They cannot pay the rent. The internet is shut off. They cannot go to school. Undocumented cannot get a job. She was with a family member that had COVID. It is not acceptable for her to go get any other job. What are the choices? And so every day we are documenting story after story of how um, we just need to continue to share those testimonies so that we are able to make those decisions. Now, the vaccine is going to come out. Who's getting it? Which community members need to be a priority? In Adams County, for example, we have 41% of Latinos. The highest number of COVID positive in um, community has been hit is Latinos. What are we doing to make sure that we are reaching out? I'm only one agency. We need a lot more to build that trust and to build that security that we are going to be uh, informing our community, holding hands, and making sure that they are not left behind. Uh, working with the Village Exchange Center, we have in three weeks we distributed two hundred and fifty thousand dollars under the Left Behind Workers Fund. I'm telling you, all these stories are real. I visited the home places in the mobile home park. I've seen the lack of, um, you know, we are hearing it as food insecurity. People are hungry. <laughs> People are hungry every single day. We're talking about basic human needs uh, that we all need to be taken into a priority. How are we making sure that nobody is left behind and that we have a seat at the table where we need to be making some of these decisions? Uh, there's a lot of work and I appreciate everything that all of you are doing within your networks, within your accountability organizations. I believe the work had just really started to be able to showcase how health really impacts our uh, minority community, how economic disparities really created loss impact in generations. And I've, I've seen it personally as one of 14 children coming from Mexico 
and learning how to create a new, uh, a new organization in a business with all of the challenges that have existed. However, I know there are solutions. I know I believe in every single one of you that will be transparent in the way of we become unit uh, as one together and really bring those resources that are needed every single day within our community. So I thank you and I'm behind all of your work every single day. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we're going to quickly run out of time. I'm going to, uh, Eric, if Eric Kicks is still on the call. Eric, uh, join us, please. But one of the things I will say that this conversation has, uh, you all have just so eloquently articulated that it's not just inequities in health care or inequities in mental health that are an issue, but it's that uh, economic inequities and injustice, educational inequity and injustice, social, political inequity and injustice, all contribute to health injustice as well, or health inequities. It, it, they all contribute to the poor outcomes that we see uh, in people of color. And I'll, you know, certainly people will say, well, you know, there certainly white people have uh, there are inequities amongst poor white people as well. Absolutely there are. But yet there is also still the centrality of race. So regardless of how you might dissect people, uh, if you dissect, if you carve out the LGBTQ community, greatest inequities are, are among people of color. Outcomes, the greatest inequities are people of color. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the greatest inequities are relying on that centrality of race. So I'm gonna, we're going to close out by a question I asked before of what can the foundation do? And Eric, several people, and I noticed you were trying to get in on the last conversation. So I'm going to let you have the first say on this. And what I would also ask of those of you who are, please in the chat, write your comments to the foundation, how you think we can, what role we can play. And please put it in the panelists and attendees uh, chat box. So Eric. Going to try to be as quick as possible. Thank you, Karen. And I am—I do not mean to barge in on the second panel. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, but what I would say around what what the foundation does, and I think I think um, you have done a, a really good job, and the foundation has done a good job in laying out your cornerstones and your your requirements for organizations and how they how they are addressing and interacting with the community. And I will pose my questions around this to the foundation because I don't know what's taking place in terms. Um, what is what is the foundation doing with touching with their touch points with community members, not just organizations who are touching? Um, can is there an individual, a personal contact that the that in, that community members can call and and take community questions that can hold the foundation accountable, not just organizations? I think when we talk about the disparity and the barrier, I would also say there's a um, there's a disparity and barrier between a large nonprofit and a small nonprofit. What are those, what are, in the submission process, what does that look like? Um, is there, is, is the submission process the same for all when me being um, in a role that I am, I have four people in my foundation, in, in, my, in my fundraising department where a small nonprofit may only, may, may only have one or, or zero. What does that look like? Um, how are they, how, how is an equitable submission process being taken into account and how, how will that affect smaller to large organizations? I also think that, um, you know, what are, from a philanthropic standpoint and engaging communities of color, um, how, many, how many individuals or what's the percentage of community or people of color that are giving to the foundation and, and what are their stances on, on, the, on the issues that the foundation is taking place? I think you guys are doing a lot of great work as far as delving into racial justice. Um, I, I see that the board is okay with that because I love your messages, Karen. What are your largest funders? Are, we, are, are you holding accountable your largest funders and, and seeing that their values are aligned not only with yours, but with the community? So these are some of the thoughts that I, I just had and I wanted to get across because, and I would love to have further conversations. About Absolutely, and I'm ha happy to have those conversations. So it's hard to say who, People should just start with me. That'd be the easiest thing that I can give to the, to the right person in the organization. 
But one of the things you brought up, Eric, we don't have as an issue, we don't have donors. We have, we are an endowed foundation, so we don't take, we don't receive donations from other um, organizations. So that's not, uh, uh, so that's not something we have to deal with. I can tell you, and, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to give you all a chance to, to dive in on that question. You know, we are uh, uh, soliciting feedback now. And there's another group I'm going to meet with right after this of nonprofit execs. And I've got several opportunities in January to meet with nonprofit execs uh, to give us feedback on the framework we're considering for using and, and uh, centering race. And many of the things that you all talked about are, are elements in our, in our framework. What we, what we believe is that one of the roles we can play is as being disruptors in, the, in existing systems, as well as helping to catalyze. In the racial inequity, we can be disruptors. In the racial justice arena, we know that it's not just the absence of oppressive systems, but it's in the presence of uh, more just systems. So things that you have mentioned that are that are part of our platform, we're getting feedback on. Certainly, starting with you know who we give money to, or not, can is uh, can be a disruptor and can and can further uh, the cause of racial equity. Uh, who, how we and who we work with to elevate, shift their power or wield our power or not is a way that we can be a disruptor in the system. Uh, cultivating deliberate relationships with partners who are aligned with us in, uh, in their values, in their operating, even if they're not quite sure how to do it yet, but they know that it needs to be done and they want to really focus on racial equity, that's in our platform. Advancing the public discourse. How do we help make the conversation about race how do we help normalize it? How do we help the education process that, um, that Annie and some others talked about? How can we become catalysts for more just policies and systems? And how can we more meaningfully and in, and in many ways engage across community? So we're looking at things that are within our control that we can help be uh, disruptive for disruptive to current inequitable and oppressive systems. And then how can we then help make room and give space for the collective effort that has to happen for organizations like yours and many other organizations that are on this, on this call and around the, and around the state to help um, hold accountable the systems. And we're talking about systems, not individual racism, not individual bias and prejudice, but um, systemic and structural racism and oppression. So that's a long answer to your question, but there's still a lot, a lot uh, more to say. So we will uh, certainly be, as we get feedback from the community, uh, we, I'm sure it will help to shape and mold uh, our understanding and how we, what we can do. So with that, I'm gonna say, thank you all. Thank all of you, the seven of you, Thank you for the first panelists. Thank you to all of you that are um, in attendance that are uh, putting into the chat function. We will close out the meeting, but we're gonna we're not gonna shut it down. We're gonna leave the leave it open for like five minutes in case you're still writing. We want to make sure everybody has a chance to get their thoughts in, so that we can um, take that as part of our as our feedback effort as well. So I just want to thank all of you. And I want to wish everyone a peace, peaceful, safe, happy, joyous holiday season, and uh, hope to and hope to be seeing all of you safely into the new year. So thanks. The staff behind the scenes just don't shut things down, please. Thank you, guys. <laughs>